Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which will feature the contents of this very familiar looking box if you've been watching our videos. Um, it isn't a return. Uh, this I think uh, I used to uh, send back a Bandmaster and now it's come back to us with a completely different amp inside. So let's open it up and see what we've got. Well, it looks like we have an absolutely first-class package job with our traditional letter. Let's separate the letter and then I'll uh, pull out the contents. Well, it's out. It's magnificent. A 1965 Super Reverb. A just beautiful original condition, it appears. Let's see what our letter tells us. 65 Super Reverb. Um, the pots are frozen, but uh, he's loosened them up wants me to go through everything, make it work right, try to keep it as original as possible. Um, it sounded good but it had inadequate power compared to what you expect from a Super Reverb. One of the Russian 6L6's was broken from the base. Okay, uh, looks like a pretty straightforward overhaul then. Well you can tell this beast is, uh, I bet the bias is pretty stout on it, we'll have to see but when you get that kind of discoloration, uh, it's been running warm. Um, we'll go over it in detail uh, once I get it up on the chassis stand. But uh, we've got really good looking chassis. We've got our uh, reverb tank, we'll have to check that out. And also our box with tubes and tube shields. So it looks like we're ready to go. Okay, let's put it in the uh, chassis stand and get started. Well, let's take a look here at the interior of the chassis and it appears that it's had a three wire power cord installed. We'll have to check to see if we agree with how that was done. Um, power transformers got a little warm. You can see some of the potting is uh, coming out the bottom. It's not terrible but it has gotten a little warm. Somebody has changed the uh, bias power supply filter cap. Looks like they might have uh, changed the diode. We've got the blue molded caps in place. And strangely enough, they replaced two, four, six of the bypass caps, but they didn't change the seventh. And I'm not sure why, maybe they ran out or something. We'll see. Wiring is immaculate. It's got the proper type of filament wiring that's tightly wound and swoops down onto the socket. Let's see here on the control pots. Everything looks bright and clean. Wow. It's hard to believe this amp is as old as it is. What's it, 55 years old? Um, I'm real impressed. Um, let's flip it over and take a look at the top of the chassis and open the doghouse. See what's been done there and uh, check our transformers. Now, although uh, it's obvious some work has been done on this, uh, the screen resistors and uh, grid stoppers have not been replaced. And that's sort of a standard procedure. Uh, so we'll have to get after those. It also looks like uh, they disconnected the death cap, but they've used the polarity switch probably just as uh, like a terminal strip so that they could connect to the leads on the end. Okay. Um, I'm also thinking on this we're going to have to uh, wire in a on and off uh, a switchable negative feedback loop. It really works on these amps. It's just wonderful. Okay, uh, let's flip it over and uh, take a look at the uh, top of the chassis and see what's in the doghouse. Okay, the great reveal and wow, it's been completely recapped with F&T capacitors which is the one that, that's the same ones I would use um, we're not sure about these resistors though they're the same old uh, carbon comp resistors we need to double check them um, all of the transformers check out even though this one looks brand new it, it all seems legit and other than the overheating uh, for the uh, 6L6's and the rectifier um, this thing could almost pass for new. It's in beautiful. There's some dents on that lovely black face control panel. 
but it and the knobs really look nice to me. Okay, um, our external evaluation is complete. Let's get started on the circuit. An interesting stamp here on the uh, chassis surface F133965 which would uh, go along with uh, it uh, being made and sold in 1965. It could be the 39th week of 65. We'll look inside see if we can find any more markings. But all in all, truly in beautiful condition. As I suspected, they're using that polarity switch simply as a terminal strip. You see the wire comes over here, connects, and then continues. Now what we've got to do is uh, eliminate those connections. Run this wire straight over to the power switch and uh, liberate this completely so that we can use it for our uh, uh, switchable negative feedback loop. We need to replace the uh, screen resistors and uh, grid stoppers and um, let's see oh and also install a proper cathode bypass cap right here in place of this old one that'll be for starters I'm kinda of working on two projects at once here uh, to keep my wife off my back I started uh, repairing and repainting this fence that goes across uh, this courtyard in front of the workshop and uh, I've had to add some boards uh, in, in place of ones that were broken. And it bothered me. I left it this way last night. And I was thinking if the zombie apocalypse occurred, slender zombies could probably fit through that slot. So I have my brand new picket here ready to go to fill it in. I'll sleep a lot better tonight. So I better set down the camera and get back to work before she screeches at me. By that I mean my wife, not the zombie. All right, the new slat is in place. I have to be careful the way I pronounce that. And uh, now it's time to paint it. I also uh, was thinking of a great name for a band, the Anorexic Zombies. What do you think? All right, time to get painting. The old carbon comp internodal resistors have been replaced with brand new uh, metal oxide resistors. So I think we're ready to uh, put the doghouse back on and uh, flip this over and take a look at the uh, inner circuit. Now the new 470 ohm screen and 1500 ohm grid resistors are in place. 2 watts for the screen, 1 watt uh, for the grid blockers and now it's time to move on to wiring up the uh, switchable NFB loop. Step 1 we find the a negative feedback loop resistor. It's 820 ohms we remove the yellow wire that connects to it, which is that one right there. We separate it from the uh, speaker output jack and run it over here to one side of our negative feedback switch. Then we go to the lower lug here, which is the one that the death cap was connected to, and the death cap, of course, has been disconnected. And we run a wire from that lower lug over here to where the uh, yellow wire that we removed originally was connected. Then we will stash this wire up here along the inside of the uh, chassis fold, which renders the modification virtually invisible. So now when we have what was originally the ground switch in this position, we have the original negative feedback loop uh, in effect. When we flip it this way, uh, we completely disconnect the NFB loop, uh, which gives us a greater gain and um, actually a whole lot better tone at a low to medium volume levels. It also allows for a much earlier breakup. Now I would say all of the immediately necessary modifications have been performed. The uh, three-wire power cord has been properly wired so that the hot wire passes through the on-off switch and the fuse before going to the primary of the power transformer. And the white wire just goes straight into the uh, other primary wire. Both the screen and uh, 
grid blocker resistors have been replaced. I've tested every one of the blue molded caps and was very pleased to see that they're all right on the money. I mean right on it. Real, these are really durable. I've replaced the uh, one uh, cathode bypass cap that was not replaced. We've uh, uh, overhauled the resistors in the doghouse. So now I think it's time to plug in the tubes, uh, hook up our bias probes, and uh, see what type of plate current, plate dissipation we're getting, uh, and uh, strike a few chords through this and see uh, what type of sound we're getting, if all the controls are working, um, and, and such, before we do our audio evaluation. Well, right off the bat, we have another problem. Uh, the 606 GCs, one of them is a really nice vintage General Electric uh, tube and the other is some sort of indeterminate probably Russian tube and the glass has broken loose from the base. Now sometimes the tube will keep working but you're facing some real problems here. There might be an air leak that uh, will allow the filament to burn up. There might be a short if this is twisted uh, relative to the base. So I'm going to order a brand new set, a matched pair of those TAD uh, tube amp doctor 6L6's uh, for this amp. Okay, so we're going to take a little break and wait for our tubes to arrive. And while we're taking this break, I'm going to uh, make a much needed modification to the front end of the 1930 chopped and channeled uh, Model A Ford hot rod. Okay, I uh, will post a video of the procedure on the Uncle Doug's uh, Hot Rod Garage channel for you to watch when you get a chance. Okay, but stay tuned because we'll be right back with our new tubes. Let's take a little break here. I went out and checked the mail and found this really nice gift package there from a fellow named Mr. Wills in Ontario, Canada. I have no idea what it is, but uh, let's open it up and, and see what Mr. Wills has sent us. Wow, what a nice assortment we got. Chicken flavored greenies, that's my favorite. And look at this, something like dried chicken breast. I'm going to have that on toast later. Little balls with bells in them to chase, party mix, and a toy that I think I'm going to hang from my rearview mirror. That's a cutie. Let's look at the note here. Uncle Doug, Canada loves Casey and Jack. We hope you have a wonderful holiday season with your super cute cats and family. We love your videos. I love the cats and my husband loves the amps. From Aaron and Neil in Ontario, Canada. Well, thank you, Aaron and Neil. From Ollie, uh, Jack, uh, Casey, and uh, all of us here, um, I know darn well that we'll be eating well tonight. And so will the cats. Okay, so thank you so much for your generosity and thoughtfulness, and you all have a really nice holiday season uh, also. I was checking the pots, and the two knobs on this end would barely turn, and as you can see, the uh, bottom of the knob is rubbing right here on the uh, black face control panel. Now the reason is, if you look at the dimples here, this thing must have been hit really hard right on these pots and they're sunken back into the chassis. So now the end of the pot, instead of being up like this so that the skirt can be parallel to the control panel, they're bent down so that the skirt is out at the top in at the bottom. So what I'll do is I'm going to remove both of these pots and then try to bend the control panel back so that uh, this indentation at the bottom is no longer present. Now I shudder to think what type of force would be required to bend this fairly heavy steel back in probably a good eighth of an inch but it also was able to crush the uh, blackface uh, control panel here and extrude the metal outward. So whatever it was, uh, sledgehammer or uh, low-flying uh, B-52, something really hit this hard. So uh, I'm going to try to do a little body work here on this metal. I'm going to use a method I use sometimes on uh, car bodies to try to straighten them is use a C-clamp with two flat surfaces on either side and try to press that dent 
forward so that uh, the front is flush. I don't know if this C-clamp and this wood though is up to the challenge of this fairly thick metal. We'll see. Well that didn't work so I tried a C-clamp that's about twice as large and all I did was break the wood so now I'm going to have to try to use a uh, metal piece back here that won't break. Um, I think the dent is a little shallower but it's still not quite right. Using about a half inch thick piece of steel plate uh, and the C-clamps I was able to bring the surface back to level. Okay, so now when I install the potentiometers, there should be no problems with the skirts being uh, out of parallel with the face. Now, as you can see, the skirts uh, have plenty of clearance at the bottom and turn freely. And another problem came uh, to light, and that is that this set screw is stripped. I don't know if it was that way from the factory or some overzealous a screwdriver wielder happened to over torque it but now I have to fix this set screw. Well I suspected since these are brand new knobs uh, that they're probably uh, made in uh, China and that the set screw may be metric so I tapped it for an SAE 832 thread then used one of the set screws that I had on hand and sure enough it holds real tight and I polished the end of it a bit so that it sort of can hold its own with the uh, chrome plated screws but I thought that was a real serviceable repair. I thought I'd give you a little update on the status of Ollie the feral cat that's been living in our backyard and we've been feeding now for about five years. Well we finally coaxed her to uh, live in our garage where she's nice and warm and safe uh, as she gets a little older uh, she just is not up to fighting for her rights like she was when she was younger and uh, so we're protecting her in here and feeding her three times a day. She gets to go out during the day and uh, sun herself and she gets plenty of uh, ear scratching and back rubbing. Uh, so I thought I'd just uh, give you a little update uh, and some happy news about Ollie the feral cat. Good girl, Ollie. Are you happy to be inside, huh? What a good kitty. Well, the mighty Super Reverb is up on the chassis stand uh, with all the uh, tubes installed except for the two 6L6 uh, GCs. Uh, and fortunately today, our order came from Antique Electronic Supply with our a match pair of tube amp doctor um, 6L6s. So let's get them out and get them installed. I also have the uh, Eurotubes bias probes in place so that uh, once we fire this jewel up uh, we'll be able to adjust the bias. Well we're all set up we've got the signal generator putting out the 200 cycle per second tone which he finds a lot easier on the ears than a higher frequency. Uh, we're going into uh, in this case the vibrato channel um, got our Eurotubes probes ready we're plugged into the current limiter and the shop speaker is plugged into the cabinet speaker jack on the rear of the chassis so let's turn this on and see what happens power is on we're on standby and since it's cold out here in the workshop and the tubes are too let's give it a couple minutes to come up to um, a warm condition I just took the amp off standby and boy you talk about a nicely matched pair of tubes. I'm really pleased with these tube amp doctor uh, 6L6's um, that may be a little low but look at the match just nice it could be. Okay um, I'm not hearing any noises I don't see any smoke uh, let's now uh, turn up our signal generator and see uh, if we've got signal coming through both of our channels the bias looks very conservative, so uh, we'll do no harm if we proceed to uh, check the channel. Wow. Now I've got treble, middle, and bass all wide open. Let's reduce the treble. Middle. Not a lot of difference. Bass. Huge difference. Because the 200 cycles is in the bass range, you can see it can be completely shut out with the bass control. So bass 
bass works perfectly. Let's go to a higher frequency and see how the treble works. Okay, here's a thousand uh, cycles per second. You can definitely hear a strong response to the treble control. Mid-range. Some some effects. I would say these tone controls work just fine. They seem quiet. I'm going to clean them anyway. can still shut that off with the bass. Okay, so it looks like the vibrato channel works great. Let's try the reverb, okay? I'm at uh, about 700 cycles. Crank it up. Now listen to this. Sounds like that organ tone Telray device. I'm just bouncing the um, reverb tank there. So the reverb seems to work just fine. Now I'm going to have to a jumper the tremolo jack and we'll check to see if the tremolo works. I made a real quick and easy a shorting plug for the tremolo foot switch jack. It's necessary on these larger uh, Fender amps to short that uh, foot switch jack. So uh, I simply stripped the shielded cable that came out of a RCA plug, wrapped the shield and signal together, and now when I plug this in to the jack on the rear uh, for the foot switch, the tremolo should work. Okay, we have our 300 cycle tone, uh, just rather low volume. Let's see if we have any uh, tremolo effect. Oh yes. That's 10 intensity. That's as slow as it goes. You know, they always need to be slowed down a little bit more. Then we'll go up to full maximum speed, which is crazy fast. Sounds like a hummingbird wing fluttering. So, we're going to slow down the tremolo a little bit. But it sounds like uh, the effects are working now. Let's check the normal channel. Well, the normal channel seems to work just fine. I'm running a 100 cycle per second tone through here, which is way down in the bass frequencies. Let's see if the bass control can augment it. Oh, yeah. Good God. The speaker's about to jump off the cabinet. So the bass control definitely works. Let's run the frequency up a bit. See about the treble control. Yep. Right there. Okay. So it appears. Oh, and the bright switch. Kind of noisy. Little change. Okay, so it appears that all the controls are working. We might need to clean the pots. But uh, I think everything's in good shape on this. So we need to set uh, the bias properly. And then I think uh, we're ready to do some audio testing. Okay, while I'm adjusting the bias here, I noticed that while you can go really low on your plate current, let me crank it up to the maximum plate current setting on this pot and we're only at about 33 to 35 milliamps and to get the most out of these tubes I think we need to go a little higher so let's uh, while we're slowing down the tremolo let's change the resistor on the bias pot so that we can gain a little higher plate current Step one, remove the 27K resistor uh, to ground from the bias pot and replace it with a 22K resistor. Now this will allow more of the negative DC bias voltage to go to ground, less to go to the grids, and uh, that will allow more plate current to pass. And step two, to slow down the tremolo, I put another 0.01 microfarad 
uh, capacitor in parallel with one of the three in the oscillation loop making it 0.02 microfarads of capacitance uh, and uh, we'll test now to see if that slowed down the tremolo sufficiently and we'll see if now with the lower uh, resistor installed if we can uh, adjust a proper bias for our 6L6's. Well I've switched the amp off of standby and I've got the uh, bias right where it was before we altered the resistor. Remember that was maximum that we could get uh, with the uh, 27K resistor. Now though we're able to crank higher. Let's go up to about we were at around 15 watts. Let's go up to closer to 18 watts right around there. Okay now let's calculate the plate dissipation at this level and see if it's acceptable. And we see at 41 milliamps and 431 plate volts we're right up at around 18. Okay maybe I'll crank it up just a tiny bit higher so that we're completely at or slightly above 18. Okay which is about 60 percent of maximum. Okay so let's uh, recalculate and see what we get. Okay, that's 18.1 watts, which is about 60% of max. I think that's going to work out just fine for us. Okay, now let's test the tremolo. We can see the little bug is flashing away there in his bedroll. So let's uh, hook up uh, the uh, signal generator and listen to the, uh, the tremolo uh, and see if it's slow enough for us. All right, let's crank up the intensity. Well, it's considerably slower than it was. I think that's going to work. We'll see in the audio test. If we like it, if it seems slow enough, we'll keep it. Otherwise, I'll go back and put another 0.01 microfarad cap across the middle oscillation loop cap, and we'll slow it down even more. Okay, uh, I think we've done everything we need to do uh, the way it stands. Uh, so let's flip this over, get Ollie and Jack uh, out, get the guitars tuned up, and see how this jewel sounds. Well, it's now the moment we've all been waiting for, the audio demonstration of the mighty Fender Super Reverb, uh, which some feel is Leo's crowning achievement. We'll see. And here, I guess. Um, now, for all of the audio demonstrations, the volume will be set just below 4, and the uh, treble, mid-range, and bass will all be set at 5. Okay, now when we use the reverb and the uh, tremolo, I will show you what the settings are for them. Also, the bright switches will always be off. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, I'm also going to show you the audio spectra of each of the songs that you're listening to. Okay, so this should be, this is a kind of a change of pace, but I think you'll get a kick out of it. Also, on the next to the last video, uh, I'm going to switch the NFB switch on and off. And you'll be just amazed as you look at the audio spectrum to see the difference that it makes. When it goes off, you'll see a great increase in the gain. Alright, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's begin our audio testing session.
Well, that about does it for this video on the 1965 Fender Super Reverb Amp. I want to thank Aaron and Neil for that wonderful gift package they sent all the way from Canada. And I also wanted to wish a happy birthday to Andrew Cooper in London, England. His daughter Nina contacted me and said he'd get a kick out of a birthday wish from Ollie and Jack and uh, your old uncle. So happy birthday, Andrew. I also want to give the traditional thanks to all our Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors who have kept us on the air for yet another month. Also, I wanted to alert you all that it appears that YouTube is going to start inserting uh, advertisements in videos uh, in which advertisements are not authorized. So I've always said uh, and been proud of the fact that this is an advertising-free channel. That may change very soon. If it does, I want you to know it's not my idea, uh, and I'm afraid we'll have to find a way to work around it. If any of you would like to join our Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors in supporting our channel, I'll put links in the video description to enable you to do so. And now, without further ado, uh, let's uh, start our Part 2 video. And uh, as I have been doing here lately, we're going to take a close look at the Blackface and Silverface Super Reverb Amps. We'll look at the schematics and compare them and see if it's possible to get a silver face super reverb at a bargain price that still has a black face or very similar to the black face circuit. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned because we're just about to begin. Greetings and welcome to our part two video. Uh, the comparison of black face and silver face circuits with the deluxe reverb went over so well that I decided to make this a continuing feature on our channel and today we will discuss the evolution of the Fender Super Reverb amplifier. Many people uh, consider the Super Reverb to be uh, Leo Fender's crowning glory um, and they never were presented however in the Tweed format. The first Super Reverb to appear was in 1963 in uh, the blackface uh, format. Uh, they continued uh, in the blackface style to up till 1967. There were two circuits found in the blackface uh, Super Reverbs. The AA763 that you see right here and the AB763 which contains several important revisions. One thing that all Super Reverbs have in common besides wonderful tone is four 10-inch speakers. They're each 8 ohm. They're wired in parallel for a total uh, output impedance of 2 ohms. Uh, they feature a pair of 6L6GC output tubes. Uh, also, they have just an outstanding, maybe one of the best reverbs of all time and an excellent uh, photoresistor style of tremolo. The AA763 really doesn't seem to be all that common. I think almost immediately uh, they revised it into the AB763 version that we are more familiar with. So let's take a look then at the AB763 that has the important revisions and that we will accept as our golden standard for the Blackface Super Reverb circuit. Here is our AB763 uh, circuit schematic. Uh, as we will see, there were about seven or eight revisions from the AA version. Uh, we're going to go through and discuss each one in detail. And I'll also try to explain why the revisions were necessary. First off, uh, we notice that uh, they have different tone controls for the vibrato channel and the normal channel. The normal channel has no mid-range control. The vibrato channel does have a mid-range potentiometer. Now the change they made from the uh, AA 763 circuit is that they changed the uh, bottom capacitor here in the tone stack from 0.033 to 
022. Now we discussed this uh, with the Deluxe Reverb. They did the same thing. Uh, and by putting lower capacitance right here in this position, they allow less of the mid-range to go to ground. Remember that the AA had uh, 0.033 microfarads, so it uh, would tend to let the mid-range go to ground. The 0.022 will uh, tend to preserve more of it. So uh, the end result of this modification is we get less of the scooped fender tone, okay? And we get um, an increase in mid-range. Now, if you are a big fan of the scooped tone, you can go back to the 0.033 microfarad cap in both positions. The next revision was also seen in the Deluxe Reverb, in which the value of this resistor, which determines uh, how much of the vibrato signal goes down to the reverb to become the wet signal, and how much of the vibrato signal continues on as the dry signal through the rest of the amplification stages. Now the AA has a 4.7 meg resistor in this position, whereas the uh, AB circuit has a 3.3 meg. Now what's the difference? Well, the higher the resistance is here, when the signal comes from the vibrato, it has two ways to go. It can proceed here through the, uh, all of the regular amplification stages as the dry signal, or, depending on uh, the amount of resistance it meets here, it will be sent down to the reverb to become the wet signal. So, by decreasing this resistance, there's more dry signal and a little less uh, reverb intensity. For all of you uh, reverb hounds out there, you can go back and change that to 4.7 meg and you'll have a lot more of your wet reverb signal. Another change that we saw in the Deluxe Reverb, the uh, AA has a 27K resistor right here, whereas our AB has a 22K, and the uh, plate resistors on the AA are both 100K, whereas uh, with the uh, AB circuit, that's the more uh, familiar 100K for the cathode signal, and 82K for the, uh, for the plate signal. Okay, now we discussed why that was probably necessary. When you uh, lower the bias resistance, and this is uh, what amounts to a cathode bias resistor, the lower the cathode bias resistance, the hotter the tube, the more the output. And uh, I think they could get away with the match, the two 100 uh, K resistors here when they had the 27K uh, cathode bias resistor in place. But once they started biasing the 1287 a little hotter, the disparity in output became more evident. Okay, the output from the plate is greater than the cathode driven output from this plate. So you have to put a higher plate resistor for the lower output, lower plate resistor for the higher output to achieve parity so that your output signal to your uh, 2606s is of equal strength. Now the AA circuit uh, had no grid stoppers. Okay, and uh, apparently uh, it became evident that they needed them, so they put in a 1500 ohm grid stopper resistors for both 6L6s, and this will cut down on parasitic oscillation. Now, the AA circuit had two 20 microfarad at 525 uh, reservoir caps. And uh, that would add up then, because they're in parallel, there would have been 40 microfarads at 525 volts. But because the surge, when the amp is first turned on, can meet or exceed the 525 volts, uh, on the AB circuit, they felt it was wiser to use 270s in series Okay, these are 270s at uh, 350 volts. 
Now when you put capacitors in series, you get half the capacitance but the voltage adds. So putting these uh, two uh, 70s in series gives you 35 microfarads and since the voltage at 350 adds, you, at, that's at 700 volts. So you can see you get a lot more protection here uh, from uh, your capacitors being overwhelmed by the high voltage surge when the amp is first turned on. Uh, down here we see the GZ34, which I don't think is a change. I think the uh, AA circuit had it also. Uh, and uh, as I've often said, I think it's the best possible tube rectifier you could ever want. Okay, so uh, I don't believe that's a change. And the final change that we need to discuss is right here the cathode bias resistor for the second triode in the tremolo circuit. Uh, it was 56K in the AA, and it's 100K in the AB. And I think we know by now that when you increase the bias uh, resistor's value, you run the tube a little cooler and there's a little less output. Okay, so that um, reduced the tremolo output, probably making it a little more uh, pleasing. Apparently to their ears it did because they revised the schematic. Now as I said, this is the circuit for the AB763 uh, version uh, of the Super Reverb. It's what we'll call the gold standard. This is the one against which all other circuits will be compared. Now recall that the Blackface uh, Super Reverbs uh, were released from 1963 to 1967. Now in early 1967 they changed to the silver face form uh, that we will discuss next. And uh, as we, we saw with the Deluxe Reverb, they persisted in using the AB763 in a whole bunch of the early Super Reverbs. So from early 67 up through 68, you will see the gold standard AB763 circuit in your silver face super reverb. And what makes this kind of exciting is that uh, the silver face forms of this amp sell for a whole lot less money than the black face. And for those who are not looking really for collector appeal but for playing appeal, um, the fact that you could get one of these for probably around half the price of the black face version makes this knowledge very valuable. Not content with leaving well enough alone, however, CBS decided to make alterations to the venerable AB763 gold standard circuit and they created the uh, AB568 circuit. Many things stayed the same. Okay, the, this capacitor and the tone stack remained the same. The resistor that differentiates between the dry and wet reverb signal remain the same. They used the same cathode bias resistor at 22K that we uh, saw in the AB circuit. But the first big change they made was to go from the 82-100K plate resistors. They changed them both to 47K. Now the end result of this is anytime you lower plate resistors you lower the output from the stage. So this reduced the output from the 12AT7 phase inverter to the 6L6 tubes. Why they wanted to do this, I'm not sure. They also felt that since they reduced it, that the difference in output between the um, a grid driven triode and the cathode driven triode, uh, remember that difference, this is, has a much higher output, this has a lower output, I guess they lowered the output uh, enough that they didn't seem to worry about trying to equalize them anymore. So these are both 47Ks. I think the first change you might consider if you have the 568 circuit is you might try the 82 100K plate resistors and see what you think of the tone. It may well Im uh, improve it. Next, they did something that we saw in the Deluxe Reverb, and that is they installed two 2,000 picofarad capacitors, 
one from each grid of the 6L6 to ground. Now what that will do is filter out high ultra high frequencies okay and apparently by eliminating these really high frequencies uh, it gives you a cleaner tone. They also uh, started experimenting with something that I call hybrid biasing. Now the 6L6's are grid bias. There is a dedicated negative DC bias applied down here and that is applied to the grids of the tubes but they sort of hedge their bet by installing 150 ohm resistors from each cathode to ground. So what we have here is a combination of grid biasing with negative DC voltage right down here and cathode biasing. Okay, I if I were you, if I had a 568, I don't know. If you love the tone, that's just fine. But uh, elimination of these would probably get you back uh, a little closer to the blackface tone. Okay, uh, This was sort of an odd experiment for them, and I don't think we're going to see much more of it. Okay, Over here, the way they uh, wired the re uh, reservoir capacitors was the same. They... Uh, use the 270's at 350. They also did something that uh, some of you may not uh, recognize or understand. They used 220k strapping resistors. In other words, each one of these, uh, these are in series, but they put parallel to each of the 70 microfarad caps a two, uh, 220k resistor. What these do is they ensure that the voltage is equally divided between the two capacitors. Remember that uh, when the uh, capacitors are in series that this adds to 700 volts. Well you want to make sure that 350 volts is directed to this one and 350 to this one not 600 to this one and 100 to that one. Okay so these strapping resistors then ensure that the voltage will be equally divided between the two uh, electrolytic capacitors. They must have liked the tremolo modification because they left that uh, bias resistor at 100K. And they increased the filtration for the negative DC grid biasing circuit. Uh, originally it was 25 at 50 volts and they changed it to 50 uh, microfarads at 70 volts. Uh, we'll see that I think for uh, several more iterations. One more change they made in the bias circuit is they ran a wire for each of the grids. If you remember in the uh, AB763 circuit, they had one wire that came up and was uh, the uh, grid bias uh, voltage was just distributed equally to the two output tubes. Well, when you have separate wires like this, you're able to then have a balance control. So this then was kind of the dawn of a way to balance the bias of your two output tubes. You could regulate the amount, the total amount of negative DC voltage uh, by changing the resistor to ground. But when you did your uh, pot adjustment, you were adjusting the balance. Okay, which is kind of a nice touch, I think. And finally, uh, something that I've I don't really consider a nice touch is they went from the GZ34 to a 5U4 rectifier. Now the GZ34 has many very favorable attributes that the 5U4 lacks but as a one viewer commented maybe they did this it wasn't a matter, a matter of being economical maybe the wall voltage was going up and by using a less efficient rectifier tube they were uh, keeping their plate voltages um, sort of under control. Uh, I'm not sure, but I only know that um, the GZ34 is a superior rectifier. And if you want to install one, all, really what you need to do is double check the bias on your output tubes. One final change they made is we see that there's no more center tap on our 6.3 volt winding for our filaments. Instead, they've gone to the virtual center tap. Okay, and I think you'll find if you look at your transformer, 
the center tap is there they've just chosen to block it off and tape the end and they've gone with these um, 100 ohm virtual center tap resistors now there's an advantage to this in that if you have a short in your filament circuit these are like fuses they will be sacrificed they will burn and, and open hopefully before the winding is destroyed in the power transformer so these give you some margin of safety that the grounded center tap does not so for some uh, lucky folks out there that have the AB763 circuit you have a genuine black face circuit in your super reverb even though it's a silver face version uh, those of you who have the silver face uh, AB568 circuit you've seen how uh, it's been changed from our gold standard AB763 uh, and you've also seen how you can change it back now let's look at the next iteration of the silver face circuit now it's time for the third version of the uh, silver face super reverb circuit well uh, it looks like there's not that many changes uh, from the preceding version uh, the tone stack capacitors are the same we said that you might want to change this to a 0 0.033 if you want more of the scooped uh, low mid-range uh, output the reverb uh, resistor is the same you can change it if you want a uh, stouter reverb more wet signal uh, they stuck with a 22k cathode uh, bias resistor but and they also stuck with a 47k plate resistor so this might be a place that you might want to change back to the 82 and 100k plate resistors uh, they kept the filters, the 2000 picofarad filters from the grids of the output tubes, uh, apparently that uh, worked and was a pretty good idea. They immediately though uh, changed their minds apparently on that hybrid bias. You notice there are no uh, cathode uh, bias resistors here like there were in the earlier version. Okay, and I think it's a good idea not to have them. Uh, all of the transformers uh, I haven't said this on some of the other versions but they're the same which is fortunate for every single circuit of variation they all have the same transformers okay they kept the two wire um, provision of the grid bias voltage to the output tube so that they could have a balance circuit okay they um, didn't change much else down here they left that 100k uh, cathode uh, bias resistor on the tremolo it looks to me like that's just a permanent change uh, they use the 5u4 about the only uh, difference between the AA1069 and the version the uh, AB568 that preceded it is the ones that where I've marked stars here okay they took away the hybrid uh, cathode uh, bias resistors which was a good idea and they simplified the negative DC uh, bias voltage um, provision uh, making it a balance control not a bias control the bias will still be um, altered by uh, changing this value right here the 15k resistor to ground that's how you will change your overall bias voltage and the adjustment right here then will send different amounts of it to each of the 606 grids then uh, giving you a way to balance unbalanced output tubes bottom line if you get the AA1069 circuit you're probably better off really than uh, the AB568 that preceded it uh, if for no other reasons then you have a simplified um, negative DC bias uh, system that allows you to balance your output tubes and you do not have those pesky hybrid cathode bias resistors now the final version that we're going to discuss for the super reverb silver face circuit is the AA270 okay and uh, I've marked here the changes that occurred 
from the uh, AA1069 that preceded it. So you can see there's not many changes. Okay, those uh, tone stack resistors are the same, reverb resistors the same, but there is a great big difference right here. On your AA270, they changed the coupling cap from a point .001 in all the previous versions to the point .01, okay, a tenfold increase uh, which will allow a whole lot more uh, bass frequencies to pass through. This can result in a little bit of a sort of a muddy output. A lot of people complain. You'll lose some of your good fender clean tone because of that coupling cap. And I think if you have the 270 version, you're going to want to change that back to the .001. Okay, also we see that uh, they've stuck with that 47K, uh, the plate resistors, for both of the triodes of the 1287. You might consider the 82100 and see what you think. Okay, now uh, down here uh, we've got the uh, same uh, lack of the uh, hybrid uh, biasing. There are no cathode uh, bias resistors, thank heavens. They have retained the uh, 2000 picofarad filters. I think that's a good idea. Anything that lasts through like three or four iterations is probably a great idea and that's the way the circuit should be. Okay, so we'll look down here and we're going to see just a couple very, very small differences. Because they're small, I'm going to home in on them a bit. And we're going to see the addition of a 0.022 microfarad capacitor to ground here in the tremolo circuit. Now, I believe this may help to reduce some of the thump that you'll get from the uh, photoresistor tremolo. Uh, I know a lot of you have heard this. Uh, you turn on the tremolo and there's this kind of a, sounds like a helicopter in the background, that thump, 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 thump. And I believe the 0.022 microfarad cap may reduce that thumping just a bit. Also, they did something out here that's kind of unusual. Now, we're used to the 50 microfarad at 70 volt filter cap for a negative DC bias supply. Well, they put in a second one right here. Okay, uh, I think that's rather unusual. Why, you might ask, do they bring it down here and come over to our uh, oscillation loop for a tremolo? The understanding I have is that it sort of kickstarts the tremolo loop so that the second you turn the loop on, it will start oscillating. I think some of you have seen uh, tremolos, they're slow to start. You'll step on the pedal or flip the switch and it might take five or ten seconds for the tremolo to start oscillating. Well, uh, it's my understanding that this wire right here helps kickstart the oscillation in the loop. And apparently they felt it was necessary to uh, add increased filtration to eliminate uh, any AC, any ripple in the DC that uh, is coming from our negative DC power supply. And finally, just a tiny little difference here, they changed, instead of running the negative DC uh, from the diode, uh, this is for your bias supply, instead of filtering it with the 50 microfarad at 70 volt um, electrolytic, and running straight into the balance control, and notice it is a balance control because there's two wires, one for each grid. They've added a, another resistor here. And I'm not sure, apparently they're trying to fine tune the voltage or who knows, okay? I, this has nothing to do with tone. It uh, may just be something um, if you have the uh, AA270 circuit, um, I'm going to say you probably just leave it alone. Uh, if you have trouble getting adequate negative DC voltage up here to your grids, you might uh, eliminate it and go back to the earlier form. Well, that's about it for this schematic review on the uh, Silverface and Blackface Super Reverb amp uh, schematics. 
Um, I'm not going to delve into the super reverb circuits which came later and um, included uh, like master volumes and uh, push-pull boost and things like that. Okay, the, um, the modification of those circuits back to blackface could probably uh, have their own uh, video dedicated, okay? But as you can see in all of these uh, Silverface versions all the way up to 1978, uh, there are very, very few differences between the Silverface and Blackface versions. We discussed them, uh, and I think with the information provided, you can decide if you want to modify your Silverface in any way to try to go back and, and get whatever that elusive Blackface tone is. Or now you will understand why yours is a, uh, circuit's a little different and just leave it as is. So that's it for this video. Uh, I really appreciate the time that you spent listening. I look forward to hearing comments uh, from you all, and I also look forward to seeing you in our future videos. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll see you soon.